Hi everyone and welcome to the show. I'm Nancy Guppy, Joey G on camera of course, and this week we are coming to you from, ta-da, Bainbridge Island. Now, Bainbridge is a terrific day trip and here's why. You walk onto the ferry in Seattle and you walk off into the very cute town of Winslow, which is packed with cool shops, delicious restaurants, and lots of wonderful public art. We've got a really great show for you, including new music from Julia Francis, an interview with artist Kimberly Trowbridge, Linda Hodges celebrates 40 years, and a visit from Barry the Bearable Bear. Hi. And we're going to begin with artist, mentor, and visionary Lauren Ida. I really love to cut paper. I love to sit there for hours and hours and hours and just cut paper and be meditative. My name is Lauren Ida and I'm a visual artist working on large scale permanent public art installations and I'm also the founder and director of Open Studio Cambodia which is an artist collective based in Siem Reap working with emerging Cambodian artists. I called up an old friend, he was from Thailand and he invited me to come meet his family, so I bought a ticket to Bangkok. And then protests in Bangkok shut down the airport, so I was rerouted to Cambodia. And so I came there completely by accident in December of 2008, and I'll never forget just completely falling in love with it right away. I can remember the smells and the sounds and cruising down the road on a motorbike and all the people were extremely welcoming and funny, down to earth, like, it was just a great experience. In 2008, I was intending to stay in Southeast Asia for two weeks, and then that turned into two years. This is, yeah, more than 12 years now. My father is Japanese, and our family on the Japanese side has been in America for more than 120 years. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 120,000 Americans of Japanese descent, including my grandmother and her parents and all of her siblings, were taken away from their homes and incarcerated in concentration camps around the U.S. My family was at Tule Lake in California. Memory and storytelling play really essential roles in all my work. Living back and forth between Cambodia and the States for a long time and also learning about my own Japanese American family's heritage have both been very fascinating and very rich points of inspiration for my artwork over the years. Mostly I work in cut paper. I cut by hand with a small scalpel, like an X-Acto knife. Sometimes I do very large scale installations. They can be 30 feet or more in length and I install them temporarily around the world. My most well-known large installation is called the Memory Net, which is like a cut paper net that has symbolic objects trapped inside of it. Silkworms and mulberry leaves, scissors, reading glasses, dice, plumeria flowers. The point of the Memory Net is that the physical object will be eventually destroyed because it's made of paper and it's meant to, to die. It's meant to go back into the earth, so to speak. So in the sunken forest, you know, we did a whole day of shooting with it, got some great shots, and then we set it free in the water. Now it really feels like home because I'm managing and running and living with many, many artists in a big villa. I work with eight contemporary Cambodian artists in Siem Reap. We do exhibitions together, I mentor them, provide them with art making materials. We're like family. We live and play together, we make art together, we travel together, we exhibit. And I found a really, a really satisfying and really profound place for myself in Cambodia. Because Pol Pot's genocide of the 1970s completely decimated the art scene and executed something like 95% of the artists, and those who fled 
sometimes came back, but not very often. And so right now, everybody's making up this, this new art scene as they go. We have very few masters or few elder mentors in art. And so it leaves a really interesting ecosystem, which is organically growing up, I think, from almost zero. At Lavi Long, I actually met the first week I was ever in Cambodia in 2008. He is like a brother to me. He was a tuk-tuk driver for 20 years in Phnom Penh. So he's driving a little trailer around the back of his motorbike, taking passengers to tourism sites, basically. And in his free time, when he didn't have a customer, he'd be sitting in his tuk-tuk painting watercolor. La Vie's artwork has a very lonely, nostalgic, sort of foggy color palette that has a lot of emotion in it. It's a lot about longing to be close to his family physically because they're always far away when he was driving a tuk-tuk. There's a lot of empty landscapes without people and kind of sad, yeah. But I really, I like that about his work. Muan Chia is 30 years old and he's a block printing artist with Open Studio and he is a double amputee. So he lost both of his arms to a horrific electrical shock accident on a construction site about uh, 10 years ago when he was around 20 years old. His work often talks about his personal life story, the struggle, of trying to overcome the stigma of disability, which is really extreme in Cambodia. You're not expected to be able to have a job, you're not expected to be able to get married or own land or really participate in society in any way. A lot of his work have really profound messages about believing in yourself, continuing to persevere and to try hard to do small things that take you step by step back to um, being able to take care of yourself and be successful and be happy and see yourself in a new way. My Seattle community has been so very, very supportive of what I'm doing with Open Studio Cambodia over the years. We've had a couple events at Art Exchange Gallery. We have had massive, massive donations of art supplies from our Amazon wish list um, and other people cleaning out their studios. Definitely without the support of the Seattle community, we could not have been as successful as we are today and we could not have given as many services as we do to the artists that I work with. My favorite thing about art generally is that it is such a powerful tool for social change, for inspiring people, for bringing up issues, for starting conversations, for creating community. I think when we use art as a tool for social change, it's extremely unique, extremely powerful, and extremely effective. When I try to think about what the future might be, I, I feel it's futile because I, I know that I have no idea what's going to happen. But I know that with the momentum that we have going, both for Open Studio Cambodia and for myself, I know we'll do something great. Yeah. See more of Lauren's work and learn more about Open Studio Cambodia at laurenita.com. Hi, I'm Barry the Bearable Bear. I am lost. Bury the bearable bear! The first thing to do when you are lost in the woods is to find the North Star. Do you know where the... Goodbye. Okay, so after consulting a helpful wad of snails, I learned that you are supposed to look for the sun. So... Here, fish, 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 fish. No! My uncle was once lost in the woods for three weeks. But it turns out he was just at home. Isn't that funny? There's the sun. Uh-oh. What is the difference between a stream and a creek? 
Oh. Here you go. It's getting dark. I guess I'll have to... Ah! Well, this is me. Thanks for your help. <laughs> That's crazy. Barry the Bearable Bear! See more John Oswald creations at josebold.com. Our music this week is the powerhouse singer-songwriter Julia Francis. Julia is joined by Darren Lucas, Ben Smith, and Andy Stoller to perform Cinderella, a single off of her upcoming summer release, Julia Francis, live at the Royal Room. For more information on Julia's record release date, including how to pre-order the album, go to juliafrancis.com. Kimberly Trowbridge is an artist and the director of the Trowbridge Atelier, a multi-year painting program at Seattle's Gage Academy of Art. Well, I sat down with Kimberly via Zoom to talk about Into the Garden, her first ever solo museum exhibit happening at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. Kimberly Trowbridge, so great to see you and congratulations on the show. So good to see you and thank you so much, Nancy. All right, so Into the Garden, it started in, in 2018 
uh, with an artist residency at Bloedel Reserve, which is a gorgeous, I don't know, 150 acre forest garden a few miles north of Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. So tell us how that show developed from that point to now. So as you said, they have a creative residency program where artists get to come in for three weeks, live on the grounds. And so I did that May 2018, fell totally in love, felt like this is not nearly enough time. I want to dive into this subject matter. And we ended up creating a fellowship program so that I could return in multiple seasons over a period of two years. And then we brought in the museum, Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, as the culmination of that fellowship so that I would be working towards this exhibition. And so it all just fit together really beautifully and kind of naturally. It was just a magic. So there are around 35 paintings, I think, in the exhibit, and they all began, began, underlined, in the style of plein air. So describe what is plein air. Plein air is a fancy Frenchy word for open air. All it means is you're painting outside on the landscape. So not in the studio, uh, you're really kind of in the elements. And so that's a practice I've developed over the last five or six years. And it's been a game changer for me. Painting in nature, you get to hear the bird songs, feel the wind. It is a spiritual experience because you're really having a dialogue with nature. My whole artistic practice right now is kind of the plenary lifestyle in a way. It's like a way of life or a philosophy of like this idea of plenary life. What if everywhere you go, you are attentive and present and noticing what's around you? That's a beautiful way to put it. Extremely meditative. Yeah. <laughs> Extremely in the moment. How did you decide uh, which uh, specific locations to paint? Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, because as you said, Bloedel is 150 acres and all of it is amazing. Um, Partly it was practical. So where I was living on the gardens, this little triad of what I call theaters or gardens near that space were the ones that really excited me the most and were easy for me to pack up with my gear and kind of go out to. And so I really fell in love with the Camellia Trail, the reflecting pond and the moss garden. And they're all very different spaces. Did the immersion in nature in this period of time, and we're talking basically three years, did that change you kind of in how you approach painting? Yes, actually. Um, There was a particular instance that happened early on in 2018 where I was in the Camellia Walk garden. I was painting, you know, really rich colors. I'm a real colorist, I love color. And something wasn't feeling right. And I came back to that same site the next day and found myself covering over all of my rich colors with neutral tones. And so I started doing a lot of what are called tonal works or just value-based works, black, white, and gray, which was very confusing to me for a while. But magically, I then learned that from the groundskeeper at Bloedel, that Prentice Blodell, who designed the gardens, was actually colorblind. And so I felt this kind of interesting voodoo happening where I was responding to rhythm, form, and shape, maybe more than the actual color. There are three different versions, and maybe more, but I noticed three different versions of the, I think the same tree trunk, all of them interesting. Why did you want to paint that tree or other, um, objects as well, more than one time. You're referring to the series of, it's actually four eight foot panels that are in the show that are of a tree and I call it the Oracle tree. And it's an old um, big leaf maple tree with moss on it. And the way the light hits her is just beautiful. And she has this kind of figurative gesture to her that I've returned to again and again. And I do think of her as an Oracle. I go to her and I ask her questions. And so through this transformation of color to tone, I really wanted to experience her and other motifs in my show in different times of night and day, but also different seasons. Um, It's just a way of getting to know the motif better in a way. A number of the paintings include human figures amongst the greenery. Why did you choose to include people? 
they're really about putting the body and the sensual human element into nature so that this isn't something that is just being viewed from outside, that it is something um, I'm within that, uh, you know, a fern can brush up against flesh. Um, it's about that sensual experience of being in nature and more specifically being transformed by nature. Now, painters are known for pursuing the quality of light, right? At specific locations. We have uh, Vincent van Gogh moved to the south of France for that reason. Claude Monet famously used um, great use of light hitting the cathedral at, I think it's Rune, I think is how you yeah. say it. Oh, I just showed those paintings to my <laughs> students yesterday. <laughs> so tell us about the light at Bloedel. Mm. So, well, several of the paintings in my show really hit on late afternoon light. What's unique about the gardens at Bloedel is that they are within old growth forests, very unique. And so to have this kind of darker backdrop allows for that late afternoon light to come in in those wonderful, glorious slats, almost like God fingers, you know, where it's such a specific shape and shaft of light. And so to me, the paintings that kind of embody that, I call them the Annunciation paintings, because it's like, where everything is revealed, like that interconnectedness with nature, um, that connection with the earthly and the sacred. And so that, that particular time of day is very exciting to me. You know, you were very involved in the installation, yeah, of uh, mm -hmm. the exhibit of Bima. Um, and I was struck, uh, speaking of um, the shaft of light, I was very struck by the juxtaposition of the black and white figures next to the painting of that bright shaft of light coming through yeah. the green forest. So how do you decide what goes where? Mm, that's a good question. And so I was very involved in the installation. I even built a to scale model of the museum um, two years ago that I've been playing with little tiny versions of my paintings um, and moving them around, knowing that when I got in the space, things would likely change. But I really wanted the show to operate in a way that when a viewer comes through it, that they're, it's like they're walking through the garden. I was really thinking about each time you see a painting and you kind of move around a corner that another pairing of relationships would occur in a similar way to walking through a garden where you're focused on one thing and then you turn a corner and a new space or relationship opens up. So I was really thinking about the garden as a template for how to experience the paintings in the show. Well, Kimberly, it's um, a beautiful show. Um, congratulations on it. And um, I can't wait to see it myself in person. And I also look forward to seeing whatever's next for you because you're clearly um, a human with a vision. <laughs> and Thanks so vision. much, Nancy. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm just thrilled to share this body of work with the world. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Into the Garden runs now through June at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, and you can see a wider variety of Kimberly's work at Linda Hodges Gallery. And speaking of Linda Hodges Gallery, 2021 marks Linda's 40 years as an art dealer and gallery owner. Linda has played a pivotal role in Seattle's visual art scene since 1981 and currently represents 35 artists, many of them from the Pacific Northwest. The gallery is celebrating Linda's spectacular career with the 40th Anniversary Exhibition, a group show featuring gallery artists from the past four decades. More information is at lindahodgesgallery.com. And that's a wrap from beautiful Bainbridge Island. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great week. Enjoy this gorgeous early spring weather, and we'll see you soon. Hey, dude. Looks like you could use a little help, yeah? Well, let's try. I mean, I'm not super strong, but I, I've got a little bit of muscle. So I'm going to pull ready on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, so this is, it's not moving at all. It's like it's rusted or I don't know how deep into the ground it goes. How long have you been doing this for? Are you even pulling? Oh, you know what? I can tell you're not pulling.
you are luring people like me in to make us look like total idiots and then you're in your little stony suit laughing hey well guess what mister i will not be mocked and i don't care if you don't do anything i am going to get this out of the ground if it's the last thing i do i'm going to show you and i'm going to show everybody and then they'll know and then they'll see that i wouldn't even hurt a fly you know that's from psycho yeah it's a great last line of the film.